is BBC World. I'm Michelle Hussein in Washington. A summit of Europe's leaders, they tell Iraq to comply with the UN, but say force can be used as a last resort. Baghdad says U-2 spy planes have begun surveillance flights over Iraqi territory. We get a view from the Saudi foreign minister. He tells us a unilateral U.S. attack would be seen as aggression. And in London, I'm Adrian Finnegan. North Korea threatens to withdraw from the agreement which ended the Korean War. And the Israeli army kills a senior Hamas official in an ambush in the Gaza Strip. Welcome to BBC World with the international news. We take you first to international divisions on Iraq and the summit in Europe that's been trying to bridge some of those differences. In Brussels, European leaders have produced a statement emphasizing where they agree. It urges Iraq to take up this last chance and comply with United Nations demands. France and Germany, who oppose war, have gone along with a formula that might allow for military action. These were the statement's main points, that war with Iraq is not inevitable, that weapons inspections can't continue indefinitely, and that force can be used as a last resort. Well, at least his arrival went smoothly. Tony Blair looked drained after a weekend of anti-war demonstrations, but this Brussels summit was hardly a rest cure. The EU has been deeply split over Iraq. I asked the Prime Minister how the differences could be resolved. First of all, I think it's important that we look at the points of unity. Everyone agrees Saddam is a threat. Everyone agrees that he must be disarmed, otherwise he poses a real danger to his region and the world. And I think I believe most people understand that if that cannot be done peacefully, it has to be done by force. And I think the most important thing at the moment is to send a signal of strength, not weakness. But in an extraordinary diplomatic maneuver, French President Jacques Chirac signaled something else entirely, his determination to resist the march to war. There is no need for a second UN resolution today, which France would have no choice but to oppose. Outside the summit, an air raid siren. This anti-war protest wasn't exactly Hyde Park size, but it made a point. European public opinion is against the war. A guest at the summit, UN Secretary General Kofi Annan, with a message perhaps tailored for the divided EU. I hope that member states will come together and argue their case out in a patient, persuasive diplomacy that is required to produce common front. Our guys are going to put together a... But the EU is a diplomatic battleground with Messrs Blair and Chirac fighting to win the European argument. No doubt about it, British officials were intensely irritated by what they see as Jacques Chirac's anti-war posturing. But they claim the center of gravity inside the EU is now clearly moving Tony Blair's way. What was interesting about tonight's meeting is that in reality not a single person around the table disputed the fact that at present Iraq is not fully cooperating as it should have. We reaffirm our solidarity with the United States in the face of this international crisis and we say no to the retention and proliferation of weapons of mass destruction. To Saddam Hussein we say comply fully UN resolution or face the consequence. So where does another EU summit leave us? With Britain and France at loggerheads, with Europe split and still a looming showdown at the United Nations. Stephen Sacker, BBC News, Brussels. Meanwhile, Iraq has reported the first flight by an American U-2 spy plane over its territory following its announcement last week that it would no longer try to prevent aerial surveillance. The foreign ministry in Baghdad said the operation lasted more than four hours, during which the U-2 overflew several areas of the country. A little later in the program, we'll have an exclusive interview with the Saudi foreign minister, Prince Saud al-Faisal, with his view of the impact of a war with Iraq. North Korea has threatened to pull out of the armistice agreement that ended the Korean War, accusing the United States of breaking the terms of the truce and of planning a preemptive attack. 
The U.S. recently boarded a freighter carrying missiles to North Korea and it sent more bombers to the region. The North is still formally at war with the South and the United States. It's reactivated its nuclear weapons program and says that any sanctions imposed would be regarded as an act of war. Our State Department correspondent John Lyne is with me now. John, we've heard much in this war of words between Washington and Pyongyang. What is it about this that makes it different? Well, in theory, this would be an enormously important move if North Korea carried out this threat. It would be ending the agreement that ended the war 50 years ago, the Korean War. So in theory, the war would, would restart. Now, does North Korea really mean that? We don't know. There's no sign they're about to start a war. We've heard this sort of language so many times before from North Korea. It's always very hard to judge exactly how serious they are. But we've also heard very strong language from the U.S. Where do you think this is going to end in terms of this back and forth? Is there going to be a concrete dialogue that's going to begin? Well, this is very unclear, if only because of the divisions here in Washington in the administration. Uh, on the one hand, some parts of the administration have said they are willing to talk directly with North Korea, which is exactly what the North Koreans have been calling for. On the other hand, you have administration officials saying they're still considering imposing sanctions on North Korea if they can get agreement from allies in the region, which is a very big if. So you have an administration in Washington deeply divided over how to respond. But however much some parts of the administration would really, with a very heavy heart, be dragged into a dialogue, aren't they going to be forced to do something? I mean, this, this kind of back and forth can't continue forever, can it? You would think. I think part of the thinking clearly here is that it's on hold while the Iraq crisis is dealt with. I think most of those believe the logic is you've got to end up talking because the consequences of a war, a resumption of the Korean War, would be disastrous, far, far more casualties than, than any possible war in the Middle East, for example. But the contrast with Iraq is, is quite unpleasant, isn't it, for, for most people watching the administration and for public opinion. It must be something that they're quite worried about, exactly that, people comparing the attitudes to the two. And people saying, well, look, isn't the lesson of this crisis that North Korea, the Americans say, has already developed nuclear bombs and you're not threatening a war with them, whereas Iraq hasn't yet, by all accounts, developed nuclear bombs. The lesson, perhaps, the rogue states is get your nuclear bombs as quickly as possible. Are there any signs, uh, John, about what Pyongyang might do next? Obviously, it's a very grave situation, but, but are there forces being mobilized? Is, is there any evidence that this is beyond the war of words? There's no sign yet. I mean, this is a, an immediate response uh, to the boarding of this North Korean freighter last December and the American alert possibly to move bombers to the region. Uh, the bombers haven't been moved yet. The freighter, the, the freighter was allowed actually to go on its way. So, so far as we can see, this is just another very loud uh, ratcheting up, if you like, of the war of words. John, for now, thanks very much. Our State Department correspondent, John Lyne. Adrian. Michelle, the Israeli army has ambushed and killed a senior official of the Palestinian militant group Hamas in the Gaza Strip. An undercover army unit waited for Riyad Abu Zayed and his bodyguards as they drove along a coastal road. The Israeli defense minister had vowed to strike hard at the militant group Hamas. This is what followed, an operation seemingly carried out by an undercover Israeli unit against Riyad Abu Zayed, a Hamas member. Privately, Israeli security sources describe Riyad Abu Zayed as the second in command of Hamas's armed wing. Hamas sources have said only that he was one of their fighters. After the ambush, Mr. Abu Zayed was flown by Israeli military helicopter to hospital in Israel, where he reportedly died of his wounds. This latest Israeli military activity comes after an Israeli tank was destroyed by a bomb in the northern Gaza Strip on Saturday. Hamas say they planted it. Four Israeli soldiers were killed. Early on Monday, the Israelis demolished a house belonging to a Hamas member they say planned the attack. Palestinian security sources say that some 30 tanks were involved. Two Palestinians were killed in exchanges of fire during the incursion. Massive crowds turned out for the funerals of six members of Hamas's military wing who died in an explosion on Sunday. The cause of the blast is still unclear, but mourners demanded revenge and promised further attacks on Israeli targets. James Rogers, BBC News, Gaza. Turkey's Prime Minister Abdullah Gal has said the UN Secretary General Kofi Annan will unveil another peace plan in a last-ditch attempt to reunite the partitioned island of Cyprus. The newly elected president of the Greek Cypriot side, Tassos Papadopoulos, has held a meeting with the UN envoy on the island. Mr Papadopoulos says uh, he's ready to start talks, 
but wants changes to the current UN reunification plan. Well, Turkey has postponed the vote on whether U.S.-led forces can use Turkish territory in the event of any war against Iraq. The Turkish Foreign Minister Yasser Yakis says the U.S. still needs to agree on a financial aid package to help cover the cost of the conflict. More from me in London later. Michelle. Adrian. Now more on Iraq and Saudi Arabia, one of Iraq's most powerful neighbors and one of America's key allies, has warned that a war could destabilize the entire Middle East. Prince Saud Al Faisal, the foreign minister, has given an exclusive interview to the BBC's World Affairs editor, John Simpson. He said that a unilateral attack by the U.S. on Iraq would be seen in the region as an act of aggression. What the Security Council should be doing is to say what exactly Iraq should do in order to finish the situation. And Iraq, on its part, has the responsibility to co cooperate completely with the, uh, with the inspectors. And in doing so, it must finish it. I mean, th there is a list. Either it has weapons of mass destruction, and therefore it should own up and bring them to, to the fore, or it doesn't, and therefore it should uh, comply with, with what uh, the, uh, the inspectors want. But once that is done, that should finish the, the issue. And this is what the Security Council should have pushed for collectively in the meeting. Would you class an American attack on Iraq as being aggression? If the, uh, the attack comes through the United Nations Security Council, uh, obviously it is, uh, it is uh, not, uh, not aggression, because the Security Council has its resolutions under Chapter 7, and it says that if Iraq does not uh, implement, it would allow use of, uh, of force. People always forget this, but all the resolution about Iraq uh, uh, are under Chapter 7, which allows for use of, uh, uh, of force. Independent action in this, we don't believe, are, are good for the United States' interests in the region. It would encourage people to think as you said, that what they are doing is a war of aggression rather than uh, a war for the implementation of the United Nations resolution. So we are ardently hoping, we are urging the United States to continue to work through the United Nations and not to create an act of individual, of individually taking charge of the duties of, uh, of the Security Council. Which is aggression. No, the Security Council Which is, would supposed, be. No, I mean if the United States is supposed to use force to implement United Nations resolutions. That's not aggression. But if the United States did it on its own, it would, it would effect, appear as aggression. I can just imagine Donald Rumsfeld or George Bush, uh, if he watches the BBC, uh, and we know that, that, that quite a number of the members of the of the administration do watch it watching this interview and saying that's it Saudi Arabia they're on the wrong side they're completely against us we have told them that we think war is going to be a tremendous threat to the region we think that especially if it doesn't come uh, through the United Nations uh, uh, authority that it would be uh, a dangerous uh, a dangerous thing to uh, to do. The only difference that I'm saying here is what is the best policy to pursue towards Iraq. If change of uh, regime comes with the destruction of Iraq, then you are solving one problem and creating five more problems. That is the consideration that we have to give, because we live in the region. These last, these last years, since the start of the, of, the, of the first Gulf War, have been the years in which fundamentalism has really started to take serious ground in, in, in Saudi Arabia. You must be one, worrying that that process is going to continue even more after this. Um, 
our worry is new the new emerging fundamentalism in the in the West more than in the United the, States. You uh, well, the United it. States and the West. <coughs> uh, the fundamentalism in our region is on the wane. There it's in the ascendancy, and that is the threat. Prince Saud Al Faisal speaking to John Simpson. You're watching BBC World live from Washington and London, still to come on the programme. Paying to drive into the British capital, we report on London's controversial congestion scheme. Money doesn't grow on trees. A shady business never yields a sunny life. If a family is at peace with itself, its business will succeed. European Breakfast provides more up-to-date insights for the business world. BBC World, making sense of it all. Every weekday on BBC World. Indonesian police have been taking a tougher stance. Asia Today covers the region's news. Anger seething on the streets of Karachi. And the people who make it. It's an ominous welcome for Colin Powell. In-depth reports from correspondents around Asia. Moves are afoot to bring back a head of state. Interviews with opinion formers. Do you believe that Afghans can actually unite behind a single leader? The news shaping the continent. Asia Today at these times on BBC World. We live in a world of limited resources. From this plant, we use everything. Where millions still suffer from poor health. People are more and more aware of malaria today. A world of waste. I think you can uh, do all kinds of things with waste. Where animals live under threat. We don't have to go into our last wild places for more energy. And people live in poverty. The deal gives villages a fair price and a secure income. Earth Report tells the stories of people working to turn the tide. At these times on BBC World. You're watching BBC World. I'm Michelle Hussein in Washington. The main news once again. EU leaders warn Iraq that arms inspections cannot continue indefinitely, but say force should only be used as a last resort. The Iraqis say U-2 spy planes have started overflying their territory. Here in the United States, at least 21 people have been killed in a stampede at a Chicago nightclub. They were crushed to death after security staff used pepper spray to break up a fight. That move caused panic, with clubbers rushing towards the exits. Here's our Washington correspondent, Nick Bryant. 3 a.m. in the south side of Chicago, one of America's most violent neighborhoods, the scene of the worst nightclub tragedy in recent memory. The Epitome Club was packed with over 1,500 people when a fight broke out between a group of young women. Pepper spray was used to break up the scuffle, triggering a deadly stampede towards the downstairs entrance. This was the staircase clubgoers tried to escape by. At least 20 people were killed in the crush. We was all trapped and locked. So people start, people start, some people had got to the bottom but had failed. And once they had failed, the crowd steadily kept on moving and moving and moving, and then people was just being crushed. At least 50 people were ferried to hospital, many suffering from serious breathing difficulties. But more would likely have escaped with their lives had the club's emergency exit doors not been locked. Our preliminary investigation of the building shows a number of fire code violations. Our investigation will be ongoing. Most of the uh, fire code violations that we found were related to locked in black doors. <laughs> Chicago is counting the human cost of a tragic tumble of events in which heightened concerns over terrorist attacks may even have played a part. America right now is an anxious nation and fear can quickly turn to panic. Nick Bryant, BBC News, Washington. It's been the first day of London's congestion charge. Drivers now have to pay a fee of around $8 to come into the city centre at peak hours. So, how did day one go? Here's Robert Hall. 
There were early risers at City Hall this morning. In the streets below, the die was cast for the mayor's greatest gamble. It's five to seven on Tower Bridge, and like me, millions of commuters have already joined the jams. But this Monday morning, they are also joining one of the largest and perhaps the most risky traffic experiments the capital has ever seen. It started, the £5 congestion charge is up and running. From During normal peak periods, 40,000 vehicles an hour travel into the new congestion zone, spending half their time in queues, but not today. Crossing into the zone, I found some routes almost deserted. Matching the launch with half-term week had eased potential problems. Other commuters, like this PR executive, had reluctantly switched to public transport. Congestion charging, leaving them no option. A hundred pounds a month extra, just for travelling to work, is a lot of money as well. I've calculated that I'll have to earn about two thousand pounds a year more to being able to pay after tax the hundred pounds a month. Three hours in, and the technology on which this scheme depends is facing its first real test. It cost a hundred million pounds to set up, and it has to work. 200 static cameras, backed by mobile patrols, aim to cover every access point to the charging zone. They automatically match number plates to a list of those who've paid through self-service machines, shops, even by mobile phone. If your £5 doesn't show up by the end of the day, the computers issue an £80 fine. That increases the longer you leave it. So far, so good for the man who hopes his scheme will show significant benefits by Easter. By next Monday, when I mean the kids are, are back on the school run, and there might be another 10, 15 percent of people trying to get through, but most people by then will be completely used to the system. It should have bedded down. Cities throughout the UK will have taken note of these scenes around London's most notorious bottlenecks. Even from the air, it was almost impossible to find a traffic jam. Mr Livingstone's big idea has had an easy birth, but the public aren't yet convinced he can deliver the transformation so desperately needed. Robert Hall, BBC News. Of course, as the Mayor said, the real test will come this time next week when the half-term school vacation ends. Michelle. Absolutely, Adrian, but uh, clearly I hope the technology keeps up because this is a massive, massive logistical operation underway in London. We'll keep you updated. But now our understanding of outer space could be transformed by understanding how gravity works. A new project in Louisiana is trying to use laser beams to track movements of gravity. It could one day explain how stars are formed or even how the universe came into being. Our correspondent David Shookman has been to Louisiana to see how it works. This is the launch of a revolutionary way of looking into the deepest corners of space. Can you go to the seismic screen? Here in Louisiana, these researchers don't have a telescope. Instead, they're trying to detect the mysterious force of gravity. Not the gravity of our own planet, but the gravity given off by distant objects that have remained hidden until now. We're caught up now in the drama of discovery, the possibility of looking at the universe through a completely new lens. And to be able to look at it in a completely different way just has to be uh, uh, something that'll yield information that's way beyond our imaginations. So how are they doing this? Well, with this equipment, they fire laser beams down these giant tubes. Each tube runs for two and a half miles. And the idea is to see whether the beams inside react to the gravity reaching us from space. When most of us think of gravity, what comes to mind is the old story of one of these falling on Newton's head. But scientists here believe something that Einstein predicted, that gravity actually moves through the universe in the form of waves, a bit like ripples across a pond. So imagine the ripples given off by an exploding star, or the gravity surging out from a planet being ripped apart by a black hole. We know very little about these cataclysmic events, and gravity could provide answers. Picture the waves of gravity traveling to Earth, passing through those long laser beams in Louisiana and making them quiver. If this works, we might even pick up clues about the biggest cosmic event of all, the Big Bang. You can see effectively much further back into the history of the universe using gravitational waves than light. Now obviously it's much harder to detect gravitational waves, but the payoff is potentially very, very big. 
It may take years to see real benefits from this work, but think how long it took to understand something as basic as electricity. Here they think that understanding gravity could prove just as important. David Truckman, BBC News, Louisiana. And the main news, again, European Union leaders have held an emergency summit. They've told Iraq that it must comply with the UN's demands. And that's the BBC World News. In London, I'm Adrian Finnegan. And I'm Michelle Hussein in Washington. Goodbye. Bye-bye. Hello again. The snow continues to fall in the extreme northeast of the U.S., but it is showing signs of easing off. We've had widespread disruption across many states, falling as rain largely across the south. That's now petered out, but still the snow falls through parts of New York State and especially up through uh, New Jersey and Maine. Seven states in total declared a state of emergency at some point or other during Monday. Baltimore and Washington airports closed here. They were some of the worst hit states with two feet of snow reported in places. Now the snow is on its way out. Good news here. High pressure dominating by Tuesday allowing the cleanup to take place. Still some snow flows perhaps in the far northeast. That's tied in with the same weather system but most of the snow from that I think across central Canada. But it's only going to be a brief respite because another area of low pressure develops bringing more wet weather extending up from Texas up again through the uh, mid-Atlantic states with again a bit more snow likely on Wednesday. Out across more western parts of the US, well, much quieter, largely fine and dry. Some uh, sleet and snow likely in the extreme uh, northwest, so Seattle perhaps catching a little bit. And some snows, some snow showers in and around the Great Lakes, but by and large a little bit calmer. But there is that next area of wet weather working its way up, which we'll need to keep an eye on. Snow showers likely across central Canada. Temperatures in eastern areas on the up this week. Temperatures further west taking a bit of a dive. Temperatures certainly are taking a bit of a dive in Buenos Aires with some wet weather arriving on Wednesday. Into Africa now, some showers perhaps disrupting play a little bit at the cricket in South Africa and Zimbabwe. Showers easing off from the Gulf of Guinea. Some wet weather at times along the north coast of Africa, part of the same weather system getting into Casablanca, which may bring some further rain to Iberia. Athens and Istanbul in particular look like staying very wet and rather chilly. Still very chilly across northern Europe, largely dry though and fine. Dry and fine across much of the Gulf as well, perhaps a little bit more cloud pushing southwards during Tuesday and Wednesday. A lot of cloud at the moment across Pakistan. It's brought some very heavy rain, pretty damp too in Delhi. These two lumps of cloud were some pretty ferocious storms. It's all only slowly continuing to drift a little bit further eastwards. Further east still in Beijing, fine with temperatures well up above average as indeed they are in Hong Kong and temperatures on the up as we see some brighter weather in Tokyo. Thank you.